Welcome. Today's topic is the unifying theory of plate tectonics. So in this discussion, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the history and the development of the plate tectonic theory. And then uh, I want to uh, emphasize the differences between the continental drift hypothesis presented by Alfred Begner and the theory of plate tectonics. Also in this discussion, we'll take a look at um, the plates and as they move, we'll look at the interactions between each one of the plate boundaries and we'll discuss uh, specific type land forms uh, that are uh, related to each one of the boundaries. And finally, towards the end of our discussion, uh, we'll look a little bit at um, the hypothesis that describes uh, how the plates are in fact uh, moving. So to start with, let's go back to the days of the mid 1920s to the late night late 1920s and um, look at a German meteorologist uh, named Alfred Wagner and Alfred Wagner was a geophysicist and meteorologist and he made a simple observation during the 1920s basically he looked at a globe and looked at um, South America the shape of the South American continent and looked at the African con continent and just simply said wow I think based on what these continents look like, they may have fit together at some point. And so based on that simple observation, Alfred Wegener set out to look for evidence uh, to show that in fact, at one time, uh, South America and Africa were together. And he found evidence to support this hypothesis in the way of fossil evidence, rock and climate correlations. And he proposed based on his evidence that he, um, researched and did field work and found he proposed uh, the supercontinent of Pangaea, which uh, existed about 250 million years ago. And if you take a look at this animation that I have at the top of your screen, it shows about 800 million years of Earth history, just pretty close to a billion years of Earth history. And if you follow the red triangle, and as that red triangle overlaps the white triangle at 250 million years, uh, you can look at the animation and see the supercontinent configuration of Pangaea. So here's the red triangle, and boom, right there would be the uh, configuration of Pangaea. So let's watch it one more time. 500, 400, and right there. And again, if you take a look at that animation, it shows uh, the configuration of Pangaea. So by the mid 20s uh, to the late 20s, uh, Alfred Wagner uh, took his evidence, uh, took his uh, continental drift hypothesis and presented it to the science symposium and found that it was not very well accepted. In fact, uh, Alfred Wagner became the laughing stock of the science world. And one of the questions that arose with uh, Alfred Wegener is he couldn't explain um, how the continents move. He couldn't explain how they moved. And, um, and so most of the scientists at that point uh, didn't really accept this, this continental drift hypothesis. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of go through the evidence uh, that Alfred Wegener uh, looked at fossil rock and climate correlations. So the first line of evidence is the evidence for continental drift um, is comes in the way of fossil evidence. And if you look at my slide here, I have a, a fossil known as the Mesosaurus, which takes on a lizard alligator type uh, structure. And so here's a, an actual fossil of the Mesosaurus. And there's a little drawing of the Mesosaurus. But what Alfred Wegener discovered is on South America, the Mesosaurus fossil existed and on Africa, the Mesozoic fossil existed. And so you have to ask yourself a question and that is how did this Mesosaurus occur both on South America and Africa? So there were uh, several hypotheses uh, that were um, presented uh, you know, for this occurrence. Uh, one hypothesis stated that maybe the Mesosaurus uh, swam across the 9,000 mile Atlantic Ocean and the biology folks got together and looked at the uh, Mesosaurus fossil, compared that to what uh, little alligators and lizards look like today. And so they quickly uh, poo-pooed the idea that it swam across the Atlantic because they said it, there's no way that it could have survived 
um, you know, uh, traveling uh, that length of distance. Another hypothesis that was proposed, another hypothesis proposed um, for the Mesosaurus was the Mesosaurus, in fact, built itself a raft and rafted itself across the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, certainly the biologists got together and quickly poo-pooed that idea, uh, indicating that the brain capacity was limited and it didn't really have the intelligence to actually make a raft. So really the only logical uh, way for the Mesosaurus to exist both on South America and Africa was really, you know, Africa and South America probably had to be together at one time. So on further investigation, when Alfred Wegener reconstructed the continents back to Pangaea time, so if you look at this slide here, this is uh, where all the continents are now together 250 million years ago. And not only does the um, Mesosaurus fossil line up in both uh, South America and Africa, but now you also get a series of other fossil evidence that also uh, have a uh, lineup and a correlation between the continents. And so in fact, here in this little band here are some uh, type of fern plants as well that kind of line up um, in terms of the fossils present on these, on these continents. So fossil evidence looks pretty good. The next line of evidence was uh, the correlation of rock types or in this case, we say the correlation of lithologic uh, mountain belts. And in particular are these little stippled areas on the, on the diagram. And these little stippled areas uh, represent tin deposits. And for uh, Earth to form tin, tin deposits, uh, there's a very specific type of geological conditions that have to exist. And so these become very isolated and very specific. And when you reconstruct the continents back to Pangaea time, you find that these little tin belts begin to match up and line up, as well as uh, rock types. And when we say rock types, we're correlating uh, both texture and, and compositions. So for example, if you look on the um, east coast of uh, South America, in this case, in the west coast of Africa, you can see these tin belts that line up pretty well. Not only that, but you have correlations of rock groups as well. So here's a correlation of rocks here. And in particular, uh, you can take the Appalachian Mountains, uh, which is in the eastern part of the United States, and it also correlates very nicely with uh, mountains uh, in the Morocco area of Africa. So now we have fossil evidence, or I should say Alfred Wagner has uh, fossil evidence, <coughs> pardon me, uh, lithologic rock evidence. And because Alfred Wagner was a um, meteorologist. Um, he was very knowledgeable about different climates. So Alfred Wegener went ahead and started looking for climate evidence um, to see if that also matched uh, with the reconfiguration of Pangaea. So up in this uh, corner here, uh, we see the current configuration of the continents. And you'll notice these white areas in each one of the continents here, Africa, South America, India, Australia. And each one of these white areas indicate uh, remnants of glaciations. And typically when an ice uh, glacier or a glacier uh, inhabits uh, land and that glacier melts away at some point, it will leave an erosional remnant. And that erosional remnant can be linked to glaciation. A good example of that would be if you went to the Yosemite National Park, uh, which is just north of here from Bakersfield near Fresno, east of Fresno, and you drive in to the uh, uh, Yosemite National Park, the first thing you make uh, you observe is a huge, what we call a U-shaped valley. And these U-shaped U-shaped valleys are very characteristic of alpine glaciation, which therefore is an erosional remnant. So when Alpha Wegener noticed these erosional uh, remnants on the current configuration of continents, and when the continents are reconstructed back to the time of Pangaea, 250 million years ago, you immediately can see that the patterns of glaciation line up really well. And so um, here, Pangaea is, is reconfigured and um, glaciated areas are lining up the er erosional remnants. And also these little arrows indicate the direction in which the glaciers were moving. And so they have a specific pattern as well. So now we have uh, uh, climate evidence we have fossil evidence, and we have um, lithologic rock correlations. And so at this point in the 1920s, 
as we mentioned, Alfred Wagner is pretty excited. He's pretty excited about taking his evidence and and uh, submitting them to the science symposium to show that, in fact, the continents are on the go. The continents are drifting. So he um, um, went to the symposium, presented his uh, evidence, talked about continental drift, and uh, this is known as the Great Continental Drift Debate. And unfortunately, as we mentioned earlier, um, uh, Alfred Wagner was greeted with a hostile criticism. And, um, you know, questions came up, why aren't the continents moving now? Why don't we feel the continents moving? And again, one of the main questions that Alfred Wagner could not answer was, I uh, couldn't answer how and, uh, and what allowed the continents to move. And so being desperate as Alfred Wagner was uh, during the great continental drift debate, he came up with a couple, um, oh, he came up actually with several um, plausible hypotheses of what causes the continents to move. And I just kind of, uh, through my readings and so forth, kind of chose a couple of them. Uh, one is uh, tidal influence uh, from the gravity of the moon. So Alfred Wegener proposed that the uh, gravitational pull of the moon had an influence on um, moving around the continents. Well, that was quickly denounced by physicists. Physicists got together and certainly showed that, you know, the moon is only um, a quarter of the size of the earth and, there really isn't any uh, way that the gravitational pull from, from a smaller body such as the moon could yank Africa around, for example, or yank continents around. So Alfred Wegener says, well, what about larger continents that broke through the ocean's crust? And again, as you look through the geologic record and so forth, there really isn't any evidence of any kind that shows uh, larger continents breaking through ocean crust and so forth. So at this point in the late 1920s, uh, most geologists and scientists opposed um, this uh, hypothesis of continental drift. And uh, basically, you know, Alfred Wagner was, was uh, ostracized, uh, you know, from the science world and again was known as the laughing stock. And how dare somebody predict that the uh, continents are, are moving around. So it really wasn't until the late 1960s, about 50 years later, that the birth of uh, uh, plate tectonics took hold. And unfortunately, uh, Alfred Wagner only, uh, died in 1935. So he wasn't uh, you know, there for the late, late 1960s to see his hypothesis really come um, you know, into a, a plate tectonic theory. So next couple slides, I'm just gonna kind of lead you uh, with some more evidence uh, and up until the late 1960s. And at some point, uh, we will come across some, what I like to say, defining evidence that separates continental drift from the plate tectonics theory. So we now come across about the late 1940s, the early 1950s, technology is getting a little better and uh, scientists are now uh, developed ways to get down to the uh, floor of the ocean and make some observations of what's taking place along the ocean floor. One of the observations that uh, stood out pretty clear to scientists during that time was the fact that when you got on the ocean floor, uh, they observed huge mountain chains, these huge linear type ridges um, that basically uh, line large areas of, of the uh, ocean floor surface. One in particular uh, is known as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And so if you look at my arrow, this is a chain of volcanoes that basically line the ocean floor and it kind of moves its way down from the north uh, to south along the ocean floor. And uh, geographically, it separates and right in between South America uh, and Africa. The picture to the uh, right um, is basically a sonar uh, picture that shows um, the elevations of the ridge and so the red areas here indicate high elevation. Then the green is a little bit lower elevation. Finally, you get to the blues and the yellows, uh, which is much lower elevation. So you can see from this sonar that uh, certainly a portion of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is very prominent. And in fact, once they discovered the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, scientists noticed that there were ridges uh, all over the ocean floor. In fact, uh, one ridge is right in here. Um, another ridge is right up in here, and another ridge is right up in here. 
Now, in terms of processes and in terms of what was happening on the ridge, can be described by the next slide. And this slide shows an animation of um, processes, geologic processes that take place along the ridge. And this is known as sea floor spreading. Sea floor spreading is where magma from the asthenosphere below the lithosphere uh, slowly rises up. And as it rises up, it uh, fills in the ridge uh, top and it squeezes its way through, causing the um, um, new ocean floor to be made and causing one side of the ridge to expand and the other side of the ridge expand. And again, this is known as sea floor spreading. And so one of these observations then during, during this period of time, 40s and 50s, was that uh, scientists noticed that the ocean floor was very active, very active with volcanism and very active with uh, earthquake um, events and processes. Now, this animation could be a little bit misleading because it looks like the ocean floor is moving incredibly fast and on the move. And when in fact, the ocean floor really on average only moves two to three centimeters per year. So if you were to go down to the ocean um, ridge and sit there and watch it, and if you watch it for an entire human life, it only move about six or seven inches and it wouldn't look like it was moving at all. So geologists uh, can tell that the ocean floor is moving by dating uh, the different extrusive igneous rocks um, that, uh, um, that uh, erupt on the ocean floor. So for example, typically on the uh, very near the ridge area where my arrow is, uh, this is where the youngest ocean floor is dated. And as you move away from the ridge out towards um, the continent and away from the ridge, the, old, the uh, ocean floor becomes older and older and older, so progressively gets older. So this is an indication that new ocean floor is being made here, and then over time, the new ocean floor is being transported away from the ridge and becoming older and older. So this is some pretty good evidence now uh, that is um, coming in in the 1940s and 50s, suggesting that, wow, the ocean floor is active, contrary to what Alfred Wagner and the scientists thought during the late 1920s. During that time, they uh, thought that the ocean floor did nothing and it was just very dormant, but it's not. It's very active with volcanism and earthquakes. So by the uh, late 50s, early 60s, onto the um, um, late 1960s, another piece of evidence was discovered that really solidifies the answer that the ocean floor, in fact, is on the move. And this is through the evidence of paleomagnetism. Paleo meaning past, magnetism being magnetic. And really what's happening here is that uh, magma is rising up um, into the uh, center of the ridge. And when magma is in its liquid form, magma has little liquid iron particles. And these little liquid iron particles will have a tendency to point like a compass needle to the, whatever the current magnetic uh, north pole is. And it's been shown that over geologic time, our poles, the north and south poles, have a, to, uh, have a tendency to what we call switch. In other words, north becomes south and south becomes north. And every time there is what we call a magnetic reversal or a switch between the north and south pole, the ocean for, floor will have a tendency to record that switch. So in my example, at the bottom of your screen, we're going to say that the uh, uh, orange would be a north reversal, and we're going to say that the south or the green is the south reversal. And we're going to come over here where my arrow is. We're going to allow magma to extrude onto the ocean floor. And what you should observe and watch is that um, we'll have uh, the earth will change its polarity between north and south, and the ocean floor will record that polarity change. So here we've got a south reversal, north reversal, south reversal, north reversal, south reversal, and so forth. And what the ocean floor can do then is along the ridge on both sides, the, the magnetic reversals uh, produce what we call a mirror image on both sides of the ridge. So this side of the ridge of magnetic reversals 
will be the same as magnetic reversals on this side of the ridge. In fact, one can take this old part of the ocean floor and pretend that this is the hinge part and you can take this ocean floor and fold it over on top of that ocean floor and you would find that their magnetic reversals match each other. And so this is evidence that the ocean floor really acts as a conveyor belt. And as it produces and makes new ocean floor, um, it moves uh, whatever kind of continents or materials on the ocean floor, kind of moves it along as a uh, conveyor belt. And so paleomagnetism represents the defining evidence that uh, clearly differentiates continental drift hypothesis from Alfred Wagner to the plate tectonic theory. And so by the late 1960s, because of the paleomagnetism um, process on the ocean floor, uh, scientists, uh, generally most scientists, if not all geology type scientists, now are convinced that the continents are on the move. So again, this is the late 1960s. And we'll now uh, uh, move on into uh, plate tectonics. This slide here shows you an aerial view of paleomagnetism. And here what you're seeing is the ocean floor. And uh, this would be the ridge right here of the spreading center right here. And then if you look, you'll see what some people refer to as magnetic stripes. And they uh, see like a stripe here, a stripe there, a lighter stripe, a dark stripe, a light stripe. And these are representing uh, north and south magnetic reversals. What's interesting is that, um, again, if you, uh, you look at the stripes, they're not perfectly linear, perfect stripes, um, uh, because it's just how lava flows onto the ocean floor. However, if you look at this side of the ridge and you compare the magnetic stripes to this side of the ridge, uh, you should be able to observe that, again, there's a mirror image of uh, stripes on this side uh, with respect to stripes on that side. And here is just basically a vertical view of the uh, magnetic stripes, um, but it's on a flat uh, type map. So given, um, given plate uh, or given the paleomagnetism evidence, the defining evidence, we are now moving into plate tectonics.